Hi, Brian. Hello. We should have some other folks here in the waiting room. There we go. And that. Hello. Adding everybody here. Thanks everyone for joining and apologize about the delay there. Hello. No worries. Hello. While we're waiting for um, Justin to kind of show up here, Jahan, did you want to give like a quick update? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, is Alex here? Alex, Alex is here. Also. Yep, he's here. Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so basically I've been, um, I've been working a little bit on some of the Go code, uh, pretty, pretty minor stuff, uh, just getting the batch, um, the batch uh, digest working. Um, but then also, uh, I wanted to clear some stuff up around the design. Um, and uh, so we also want to resolve, there's, there's some questions about like, you know, uh, security and stuff like that. So I want to get to the bottom of that. Um, the uh, right now. Yeah, sure. I mean, it might be better. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Todd, go ahead. I mean, it might be better if Justin was here. Um, I think Justin, did Justin think it was 8.30 or something? Um, well, anyway. Um, but yeah, I'll just go over it and go over it again. So, so basically the first thing is that we've been, um, so in the documentation overview.md, um, and generally we've been talking about something called an orchestrator. Um, and uh, the way I see it actually, the orchestrator is actually um, two different different pieces of functionality, very different pieces of functionality. They've been put into one uh, binary, which is being called the orchestrator, um, which is totally fine for those to be in the same piece of code um, for convenience. Uh, but they're but they really are two different sets of functionality. So one set of functionality the orchestrator does is that of what I would call an ETH signer. Um, and that's basically when we were doing the when we were doing the design earlier this spring. We first what we wanted to do was to actually put Ethereum keys directly into the Cosmos module, so um, validators would would have their Ethereum keys in the Cosmos module, um, and uh, it would just be you, you know it would be like the signatures would be sort of being produced by by the uh, Tendermint consensus somehow. And we realized that that just with the way the, the, the way that the cosmos works and is organized and stuff, um, doing it like that just wasn't a good option. We'd have to change a lot of code in cosmos. Um, and another thing we wanted to do is we wanted to take the, um, again, with the, with the validator code, we wanted to bring in the, um, the state from Ethereum and um, bring it directly into the consensus process. Um, and there was some back and forth. We talked with Ethan Frey about that at one point as well. And there's some back and forth on that. But the idea there was basically that um, you bring the Ethereum state for 50 blocks to go into the consensus. And if anybody's Ethereum state differed, um, they would automatically get downtime um, because they simply wouldn't be producing um, results that were consistent in consensus. Um, so we opted not to do that as well. Again, that was a technique with, with the code, the way the code and Cosmos Tendermint is organized, that would be, we'd have to tap into Tendermint at a very low level or something. Um, so what we're doing instead for both those things is there's something that I would, functionality I would call the ETH signer, which is being done by the orchestrator right now, which is that it holds uh, some Ethereum keys. Um, it signs over things in Ethereum. Um, the keys are associated to a given validator um, and the uh, ETH signer is also submitting those signatures in messages um, to the Cosmos, um, to you know, to to to, to, to the Cosmos and with, with the Cosmos messages um, flow um, the way that any other message is done. Um, yet it is still associated very strongly to uh, other oh, Justin it's associated very strongly. Yeah, sorry to about that. Got caught up to to an individual uh, validator. Um, and so that's the, the ETH signer, it's, it's never doing anything that the validator wouldn't have done. It's, it's not its own role. It's just a tool that the validator uses because that's just the way the code was organized. And so you can't talk about there being orchestrators that are separate from validators. Um, 
And then on the other side, also the, the East Center also, um, we're still working on this and I'm not 100% familiar with um, the ETH Oracle design as it stands right now, but the ETH signer is bringing in a uh, state from Ethereum and putting that to the consensus process as well. Um, but again, it's doing that in service of a given validator and its identity is the same as the validator. And then there's the, uh, the relayer functionality, which is the other piece of functionality that I think exists in the orchestrator um, code. And mm -hmm. the relayer is just like other relayers and other systems um, like IVC, the relayer is 100% um, 100% uh, you know trust uh, uh, trust like trustless or it's like anybody can run it um, and we we don't need a you know we, we don't need a trust the people running the relay they they just get these um, transaction batches and valve set updates uh, off the Cosmos chain they submit to Ethereum and they make um, a profit off of uh, you know by paying less for gas than they pay for um, and they pay for the uh, less for Ethereum gas than they get in fees off the transactions in a batch. Um, so that's the relayer. Um, so I just I, I just think everything will be clear if we think about it that way because um, there's not really um, because there, there's not really much tying those two roles together other than that they're in the same piece of code. So then on to the main thing. Sorry if that was long winded. Um, on to the main thing here. Um, there has been some. I I where was a quite there was. Uh, questions from Alex um, last stand up about whether validators need to have knowledge of the current val set. Um, and I wrote an issue. It's uh, issue 70. Um, I could, I could put it in chat for everybody here. Um, I could also share my screen. I don't know if that would work. For, I don't know. Sometimes annoying. I could read fuzzy stuff, but uh, I, I put the link in, in, in chat. And so the first the first question last stand up was was like whether validators need to have knowledge of the last val set to submit um, to submit a, a, you know anything to the um, to the Ethereum contract and they don't directly need to so relayers uh, don't need to oh, sorry sorry validators don't need to um, do anything with the current val set because they simply sign and they may be part of the current val set they may they may not, they may not be but they just sign it and then a relayer takes it and puts it onto the um, onto the Ethereum chain, um, and there was a thing I was clarifying in the first the, the first comment of the issue. I was clarifying that um, while you do pass in when you call the update val set and submit batch method, you pass in the current validators, the current powers, and the current val set nonce. You pass this stuff in, but that's passed in by the relayer. Um, so the validators didn't need to know about what that stuff was. The relayer knows, um, and this is really important. Where this really where the rubber meets the road here is that the validators know what the ETH state is with a delay um, because we have to say there's some number of blocks uh, during which you know it's not finalized on ETH. And so we just say arbitrarily, there's gonna be some delay um, and that's gonna have to be configured at some point. We'll have to figure out what the best delay to use is. But basically let's say it's 50 blocks just for sake of discussion. Um, the, the Cosmos state, in the Cosmos state, um, there is information about what the ETH state was 50 blocks ago. And so if the, if the validators, if the, yeah, so, so if the validators needed to uh, do something involving the Ethereum, if they, they do need to do stuff involving Ethereum state, but when they do that, they have a delay. And so if there was, if, if, if um, there was blocking on that delay, then it, then it affects throughput. Um, and so it's, it's better to have as little blocking on that delay as possible. Um, so they don't need to have knowledge of the uh, current val set to make an update, like just strictly just looking at what the contract needs. They, they don't need to have that. Um, and so Alex is asking basically about, and, and also Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong about what your question was and stuff, because maybe there's some misunderstanding there. Um, but basically um, Alex is asking about other, you know, other, other, um, other reasons that the validators might need to know um, what the last val set was. Um, and I'm not sure I necessarily 100% understand all of the, um, all of the reasons that Alex gave, but I'll just, and I'll just, I'll, I'll let you chime in Alex, Alex really quick, but I just wanted to, to just, just um, first of all, just go over my under, my current understanding of how this will work. Um, and this is, I'll update overview.md with this a little bit simpler than what's written there now. Um, in overview.md now there's some stuff about confirmed being a thing, which is where the val set would know 
um, you know, would, would know when uh, enough validators had signed something that it could be submitted, um, which of course implies knowledge of the current val set. So my understanding of the flow for a batch is, um, so step one, users send transaction requesting some tokens um, uh, to, that they send on Cosmos. They, 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 they basically send tokens to an Ethereum address effectively. Um, once that happens, they, those tokens are no longer transferable and the transactions go into a pool, the transaction pool. Um, then somebody requests a batch and that's a permissionless operation. Anybody can request it, but I think that's based on fees. Um, then the Cosmos state machine run by the validators assembles a batch, which contains the most profitable transactions that are in the transaction pool. Um, and there's some more nuance thinking about this, which I'm going to gloss over, which, which Justin could, could address it if, it if it's important, but I don't think it matters for this question. Um, but basically they, they look at all the transactions for, you know, for a given token. Um, they look at all the transactions and they say, um, you know, which transactions have the highest fees attached. And that's really all they need to know. And they put those into a batch and um, they try to make the most profitable best possible. So having the highest average fee per transaction um, minus the overhead and, and, and all that stuff. And so that's a deterministic thing. They don't need to know about the prices because all they look at is the, the fees versus, um, you know, versus other stuff. So uh, they just make the most profitable batch possible. Um, the batch has a nonce. The batch includes the latest valve set. Um, that's, you know, due to the work we did to combine the valve set update and the batch methods. Um, but so, so it has a, a, a nonce, it has a valve set um, and has the transactions, of course. And the transaction in that batch are removed from the transaction pool. That means they're no longer available. They won't accidentally get included in another batch because they're not in the transaction pool anymore. They're not available anymore. Um, now the batch goes into um, another spot in the, uh, in, in the, in the Cosmos state uh, where it says, hey, this is ready to be signed. And so the validators, ETH signers now, uh, they all submit signatures over the batch. Um, and they just submit signatures over the batch. They don't think about uh, you know, whether they're in the VAL set or not, or, or, or who the VAL set is or anything. They just sign over the batch. And so you have all these batches gathering. Well, let's just consider you have this batch right now, gathering signatures. And once it has enough signatures, the, uh, some relayer somewhere is just watching this. And they know what the latest VAL set is. They don't have to wait 50 blocks because their knowledge of the VAL set on the Ethereum chain does not go into consensus, is not consensed upon. And so they don't need the delay to ensure finality. They just go with what their latest knowledge is. And once they see that it has enough signatures to submit, they take it and they submit it. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's that. And so those tokens get transferred on Ethereum. Um, and then you have the, uh, on the other side, you have the ETH Oracle on Cosmos. And so um, it's watching the Ethereum chain, again, with the, with the 50 block delay this time. And so at some point it's going to see, okay, uh, that batch got submitted and um, what the, what the cosmos state machine will do then is that any batches that are in the batch pool with a lower nonce, um, which have not also successfully been submitted, um, have their transactions released back into the transaction pool. And those transactions are now able to be tried in a new batch. And the, um, and, and so you, it, it, it's, 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 it's safe at that point because you know that those batches, that those transactions um, can never be spent on Ethereum because they're in batches that have a lower nonce than the current nonce. Um, and the current nonce, uh, so, so you know that if they hadn't been submitted, yeah. they're not gonna be submitted in that batch. So that's, that's it. All right, yeah. So I think that that's, that, that's I mean, it's a good memory, but it's a little dense. Um, if you're not, not already pretty deep well, into I mean, the design. Well, I think we need to discuss it with Alex. I mean, I, I think it's like, yeah, we need to we be, well, give I mean, an overview for everyone else, but that's the important thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, thank uh, you. And thank, thank you very much for explaining. Um, so it's a workflow. I think, um, there's a lot of consensus on the process. It's just some of the implementation details, like, um, there needs to be a tally to figure out that more than two thirds of the validate, uh, orchestrators have signed it. And uh, why does there need to be a tally? Uh, that's what we were just trying to outline here, that because of the probabilistic finality of everything, 
you don't need to tally on signatures. You only need to tally on orchestrator events because that's the only time we accept input from Ethereum. Um, sorry, I, I didn't get that. Um, so when you, maybe I didn't use the right words. So the orchestrator sign a badge. Yeah, mm -hmm. so including the data updates. Every orchestrator does this and submits this information to the Cosmos side. And then yes. this data is consumed again by, let's phrase it, some logical element that then calculates if more than two thirds of the, um, the orchestrator's power has submitted the, um, the valid signatures. Right, and this is, a, I think the confusion we had in the past, this is either on the Cosmos side or in the orchestrator side. And uh, for the MVP, I just built it in, on the Cosmos side. And I think you had the vision that this should go into the orchestrator side, which is also well, a solution. If you really want to simplify it down, you could say that the, um, so orchestrators, so, so let's really strip this down and say that you have an Ethereum signer and it submits the signatures to the Cosmos chain. It's the responsibility of the Cosmos chain to verify that the signatures are correct, but otherwise it's just a storage medium. It doesn't care how many signatures they have or, um, and it only cares about who submitted them in the sense that if somebody doesn't submit a correct signature, it's going to slash them. So all, all of the checks it's doing are individual. At no point does it look at the collective group of signatures and make decisions about them. It just looks at a signature that got submitted and says, okay, this is a signature over the correct thing. And it looks at whether a validator submitted or didn't and decides to slash based on that. Now, then you have the relayer, which is going to take these signatures and submit them to the Ethereum chain. And conceivably, this relayer doesn't even need to check the power. It can just assemble them into a Ethereum transaction and send it to the chain where the contract itself will check it. Um, and so long as so long as you make a validator set, at least every time 33% of the power changes, you can guarantee that it will be possible, uh, even if only by brute force, to play back a correct sequence of updates. So you really uh, need, so, um, and speaking of, when I say using brute force, um, it's not like it's gonna cost you $20 to try. You can call the test endpoint on your local ETH node and it will tell you what the output is without paying for it. So conceivably, you see this can all be thought of as very simple. You don't actually need to write checking into any component except the contract itself because following simple rules on the Cosmos chain is sufficient. Yeah, I would add the important thing about the 50 block delay is and this all really comes down to the 50 block delay uh, is, mm. is that the relayers, the people submitting the Ethereum transactions, they don't need to wait 50 blocks. Well, I don't think that's even relevant at this moment yet because Oracle operations are delayed, yes. But the fact of the matter is that anything, um, but, the, but the real realization, um, I think the big problem we've made is that we've tried tying Oracle stuff. Uh, uh, so we've tried tying stuff that goes Cosmos to Ethereum, to stuff that goes Ethereum to Cosmos. And there's only one case where we ever care about that, and that's batches. And you should think about it as two completely separate things uh, because they're just two parts of the same state machine. Um, but they're very far away from each other. You don't need to think about them at the same time. If that makes sense. For me, the there was a logical component that checks the that more than two thirds have signed. And if you say that this can be done without any gas costs, then I don't mind. I mean, this is a, then a solution that can work. I mean, otherwise you would just burn gas, which is quite inefficient. Um, yeah. So, and then it's, it's left of the design decision, right? Either put it on the Cosmos side, put it into the relayer, and I see your point. So um, the Cosmos side won't be able to authorize anything. So that's something that we can't have, right? So it it's, will be a, a store just for signatures. The only thing that it can do is just verify that um, this um, that there is a valid signature submitted for an Ethereum address that was stored with a, in the system and once with an a, val um, a validator. So that that is yeah. what it can do now. 
Yeah, the one thing I'd say that the Cosmos side does above being just a storage database for signatures that then, you know, are, are handled by the relayers are completely separate, um, is that it will slash uh, it will slash validators whose ETH signers, um, what we were calling orchestrator before, whose ETH signers um, do not sign. Uh, on. So if a batch goes into the state in, in, the, in the place, I don't know, remember what it's being called right now, but if, if a batch is, is in a Cosmos state, like this is supposed to be signed now, um, and your ETH signer doesn't sign it within some, you know, some time limit, um, then uh, you get slashed for downtime because uh, you're, you're not, you know, you're not acting consistently because if your Cosmos node uh, was participating in consensus and put the batch into the batch pool, then your ETH signer should be signing it. Otherwise your Cosmos node is not agreeing with your ETH signer and your system's malfunctioning and you get slashed for downtime. So that, that's, that's, that's the only thing it does beyond just storing the signatures. Um, slashing definitely needs to be implemented on the Cosmos side. Yeah, we haven't written any of the slashing yeah. stuff yet, have we? Yeah, I, I've yeah, created an issue that we, I, you can, can reach with, with a lot of questions and things that should help us to come up with a slashing solution. Um, I, I was about to say that, so there's a time window of 50 blocks now, or 50 Ethereum blocks where a signer can submit a tra um, um, sorry, an orchestrator can submit a, uh, trans a signature, which may not be picked up by um, by an orchestrator and relayed. So this is a, the time window when the um, yeah before the oracle event happens, right? So yeah, there can be late signatures. But well, we want to slash for late signatures. So we want to slash if if your ETH signer hasn't signed. Like we have to figure out like how quickly we slash, like whether maybe it's just one Cosmos block, really. I don't know why it should take any longer, actually, but you know, we might find that uh, better to no, go two or three. Can't. For mempool reasons, it's oh, okay. Uh, um, for like mempool reasons, it's actually kind of hard to guarantee that you get a transaction in when you want you want it to. So um, mm. we 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 should not uh, depend on single block. But um, we're talking about like a small amount of Cosmos blocks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think it needs to be more than 10 or 15 um, to be really safe. But uh, I was having these trouble. Um, I was having trouble in the tests guaranteeing that things got into the right block. Um, and I've actually written a ton of retry logic. And this is, you know, a completely isolated test blockchain where everything is one millisecond from each other. So, yeah, can we um, can we talk about broken it and do a deep uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let's let, let's move on. Uh, this 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 weekend we ran the uh, the broken net test net. Uh, so our first live Cosmos uh, Cosmos uh, test network, um, and we successfully managed to deploy. So okay, we successfully got all of uh, built a network with uh, built a Cosmos chain with 10 validators. We had all of those validators uh, generate and register Ethereum keys. We then use the contract deployer to deploy the uh, to deploy the Peggy contract with that validator set using those Ethereum keys that they had set. Um, then we got everybody to start running their relayers and ETH signers um, and we successfully relayed uh, one, um, and we successfully relayed an ERC twenty uh, deposit from Rinkaby to our Cosmos test chain. Um, so what we did not manage to do successfully um, is that it turns out. Uh, so good thing about Broken Net is that we had a, a, a very varied power distribution. We had we had uh, validators. Um, validators with equal power ratios, and then a few with lower values, a few with higher values, um, and then a few with like 1% of the validating power or something like that. And uh, we found a bug where the contract deployer deployed the contract with a validator set not properly sorted. Um, so even though everybody's, everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, ETH signer signed the val set correctly, um, they signed it in a different order than the one that was in the contract. And this resulted in us being unable to update the validator set on, um, on um, the validator set on 
validator set on Rinkeby. Now, in theory, the signatures exist and we can just go and uh, change, change the signature order and successfully update the contract. So it's not like a contract is lost, um, but obviously it's not a bug that should exist and the contract deployer should not do that, um, should ensure the correct order, uh, should ensure that it uses the same order uh, as the signers do um, for, for its initial hash. Um, then the, uh, the, where was I? Yeah. Um, then we had some problems with the Oracle code, um, where some event is breaking the parser and I need to go and look at it. And to be honest, I'm not too surprised about this because I sort of wrote the parser, uh, you know, in about 45 minutes, uh, and it's just a bit hacking. So uh, obviously somebody submitted a contract call with very strange arguments um, with the wrong bits and it's just crashing, crashing the parser. Once we fix the parser, we should be able to relay infinite numbers of ERC-20 transactions on the existing still running uh, broken net test net. Um, in general, I would say we, we were successful in the goal of broken net, which is to start identifying production style issues while some features are still being developed. You know, obviously we're still working on the design for transaction batches and big parts of the design, but we were able to find problems that actually have very little to do with what we're, with our design and coding problems and a lot to do with the execution environment. For example, the, uh, the like Oracle event parser works fine and absolutely anything I can throw at it in a CI environment, which makes me think somebody sent a contract, uh, sorry, somebody sent a transaction on Rinkeby to our contract, probably some sort of bot. Uh, and that's what's breaking the parser. Although I haven't investigated to confirm that yet. Um, but that's exactly the sort of thing you only figure out with an actual test net and exactly the sort of thing that's really valuable to get uh, you know, before everything is finished, because it's something that I can go and work on now uh, while other things are still in work. Um, yeah, so that's Broken Net 1, um, and I'm hoping to do Broken Net 2 in uh, two or three weeks, uh, and we can automate some of the bootstrapping process so that it doesn't take us two hours to launch the chain this time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's most, mm, yeah, Deborah? Oh, so also curious if you have outlined what the next few weeks will look like and maybe when we can expect some regular test nets and more participation. Yeah, regular test nets. Um, so uh, obviously we need to get transaction batches working before we can do regular test nets. Um, on the other hand, we're not we're not too far from having transaction batches working. We need to clean up some of the design. Um, we then. I think that we can have working batches and theoretically a proper test net in three, four weeks. So, you know, first or second week of November. Um, and then, and then we can be, uh, you know, actually doing a more serious test net then. Um, although we still need to do slashing conditions and, um, we can't do an incentivized test net before we have slashing conditions. And we also can't get very serious about um, production deployment until everything uh, properly saves out to a Genesis JSON if you're doing a chain restart. Um, so those are, the, those are two issues that also need to be handled. And then finally, we have to actually rebase and upgrade to Stargate, which will probably take me two or three days of upgrading the tooling to deal with uh, no more amino out of the, out of, out of the RPC endpoints. Um, and I know you've so, got like a blog post coming as well, right? So folks can kind of expect this in a written format as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. All these updates are going to be written down. Um, hopefully today or tomorrow, we will see if my schedule cooperates. Um, and we can outline what sort of progress we've made and all of that. Um, but yeah, I am pretty happy with all of this. Um, and actually, uh, I, um, I feel like I do need to say that Alex did an excellent job with a lot of the Oracle code because there was a misunderstanding about, you know, what needs to be signed, but I played into that a lot with the way I wrote the documentation. Cause for a while there, I was thinking, Hey, you know, maybe knowing when something has passed on the Cosmos side, isn't a bad thing. Um, it was, it was, it was really, uh, a long discussion with Jahan that made me realize that, no, there's no useful scenario for having this information at all. 
And uh, then in BrokenNet, we ended up encountering a bug related to that. And I'm just like, okay, it's better for it to go. Um, but that wasn't a misunderstanding on Alex's part. That's what I asked for. Um, we just don't actually need it. Um, so I just wanted to make that very clear for the record because um, otherwise Alex's code worked really pretty beautifully for something we just threw together quickly. It was, uh, it was orchestrator bugs that we encountered on BrokenNet. Um, or not orchestrator, ETH signer and relayer, although I'm gonna need to go and rename everything too. But anyways, um, yeah. So the real big things in front of us are transaction batches. Um, then slash, uh, so it's transaction batches, Genesis file, uh, and then slashing. Um, after that, we have a functional branch. Um, for batches, I really wanna get them out by, uh, um, I really want them working early next week. And I want a broken net with them like end of next, uh, end of next week. So not this, this Saturday, this coming Saturday, but the one after that would, I would be my, ideally my time. Um, and I really hope to make that happen. Exciting stuff. Anybody have any questions um, they want to ask or ask in the chat? Uh. I, uh, so, you know, since, oh, Alex, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just posted the link here. I think slashing is very important and um, yeah, to have some people's input here would be very much appreciated. I um, looked into some other examples how slashing can be implemented and copied let's ideas or let's conditions into this um, yeah, GitHub issue. So it's, it's more or less a set of questions and uh, of course needs to be then properly um, specified so that we can then just implement it. Um, but if this can be discussed on a bigger group, that would be very much appreciated so that we cover yeah, scenarios that are not in that list already. Yeah, um, I had a conversation with, uh, with, with, with Chris Goes back when we were first designing Peggy about what potential slashing conditions would be. Um, and I have some notes that I need to put into that issue. And then I'll probably try and refocus his attention on it when we get serious about making, uh, when, um, when we get serious about actually implementing slashing so that we can make sure we have um, good conditions. And I would hope to follow that. Um, you know, ideally I would like an incentivized test net or an audit or something like that, you know, pending funding, planning, lots of things um, in early December or so. Um, and if we can sort of make that date, I think we'll be doing pretty good. Um, you know, we've just got to try and get batches working, take care of these problems, and then rebase onto Stargate. We have to decide when we want to rebase onto Stargate. I think we at least want to finish uh, batches first. Um, and then, because that's really all Peggy logic, but exactly how the Genesis file works and slashing works, may be Stargate dependent enough that we want to rebase on Stargate before we do that. Uh, do you have an, I think everybody will know a little bit more about what it takes uh, to upgrade stuff in a few weeks as it seems to sort of be reaching critical mass at the moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could, this is not really the target or anything like that, but, but I think uh, Alex, like a major, um, a major type of slashing we could look at is basically any time the ETH signer um, is, is not acting in, um, in agreement with the consensus process. Um, so if you're not signing stuff when you're supposed to, then, then you get slashed. And I, and I like, uh, and that it goes also for, for Oracle related stuff as well. Um, but I think, you know, we can look at that as being a whole category and, and a way to think about the slash. And I think a lot of the stuff you have in here is, is that, um, and then also think about what's like, what's outside of that concept. Um, and I think for most stuff with the ETH signer is not signing something or whatever, um, that's like a downtime thing. We also might want to think about where is it a hard, you know, slash. Um, and, you know, obviously, I guess maybe if you, if you sign a transaction batch that is, that is wrong, um, then, uh, then you probably should get sl hard slashed. Um, whereas if you just don't sign a transaction batch, then it's, it's a downtime. 
Um, but that's kind of how I think about it. It's like the slashing is a large part just to keep the ETH signer acting in congruence with the, with the Cosmos module. So um, what's the best way, Justin, for us to have a discussion or people want to add their thoughts or comments um, just on the GitHub or um, I also put a Discord link in there as well. Um, yeah, so um, I think that we should try and keep these sorts of design comments to GitHub for now and people can you know, sort of show up and put their and, you know, put their thoughts on slashing and such. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff that we have specced out fairly well at this point. We just need to go and write and stabilize. So um, for transaction batches, at least, I think that should be the immediate focus. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like more mm -hmm. very soon. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm really hoping to see bidirectionality soon. It'll be fun. Um, about uh, Stargate, if we can do Stargate migration before Genesis updates, um, then it would be less work, I think. And yeah. we would need Genesis only or Genesis data if we want to keep or persist data between test networks. And if broken net is end of life, then there's no need for net. So um, yeah, I, I would just prioritize it after Stargate up upgrade. But yeah, uh, of I course, agree. batches batches first, so that that we, um, yeah. we have a full end-to-end -end demo. Yeah, broken net is, was never intended to survive a chain restart, um, so it's it's not a consideration. Um, it's a you know it's a very short-lived test net, uh, not in the sort of longer-lived official test net theme, more in the like oh let's figure out what's broken theme, but. Anyways, yeah, uh, it um, sounds like we have a good sort of demarcation point. Um, I think that's everything we want to address today. Anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you all for coming and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And um, hopefully everybody will get the chance to read my blog post coming out uh, whenever I find time in my schedule to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Thanks a so lot. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. bye.